So welcome your board, our parents. God bless you in Jesus' name. So I will, I will stop the music here. Mommy. So parents, if there is noise in your background, please help mute it, please. If there is noise, but we wish to see your face. But if there is noise, you can mute just your audio. Thank you, ma'am. So we're going to start with opening prayer. So uh, one of our dads will be leading us in opening prayer. Then we have our welcoming our speech, brief one, and then I will continue the we hand over to our first speaker. So thank you so much for connecting. God bless you, Paul. God bless you. We really appreciate. Thanks so much. So um, I'm going to uh, invite our daddy, um, Pastor Wole Oshinawo, to pray for us. Thank you so much, Ma. God bless you. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because before today, you are aware that this program will hold today. We thank you because you have blessed us with this um, wonderful um, opportunity to be able to learn a lot of things. Father, we pray that everyone that is connected to this program this today, they shall be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the necessary information that we need, that you will pass it across to each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we commit all the speakers unto you. We pray that... They will not speak of themselves, but they will reveal the hidden things that you, the Almighty God, has given to them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we commit the facilitator unto thee. We pray, Lord, that you will guide her, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We also speak to the airwaves, to every, every um, app, every device that will be connected. We command them to obey the voice of the Lord. There shall be no disturbance of any kind in the name of Jesus. Amen. At the end of this program, it shall everyone shall unanimously agree that our lives have been impacted. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank for you. We pray Lord. in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Amen in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. So I'll hand over to um, Mrs. Timidayo. Hi, everyone. You're welcome to this glorious event. We are very glad that you have connected. We are, we are praying that you will 
you will gain something from today. We just want to say thank you to all our glorious um, Christian, our glorious children, Christians, um, parents for connecting with us today. God bless you, Ma. God bless you, sir. And um, we're hoping that you invited all your friends and we pray that you are blessed in Jesus' name. We just Amen. want to thank our, our speakers as well. Thank you, Maz, and thank you, Sars, for taking this opportunity to come and impart our life. We are so glad to have you. Thank you so much. And now I would hand over to our host, our humble host, our wonderful facilitator, Drama. our auntie, our mommy, our pastor. <laughs> God bless you, Ma. God bless you for this opportunity. We, we do not take this um, privilege that you've given to every one of us. We do not take it for granted. God bless you, ma'am. I hand over to you, Mumi. Sister you. Joy, how do you do? Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. So I'll be sharing my screen. Um, okay, so, um, uh, Mumi, tell me that. Can you please confirm if you can see my screen? Can you see yes, ma'am, I can see it. Thank you. Yes, you yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So um, I want to welcome everyone, you know, to our event um, this afternoon. We are so privileged to have you, and we pray may God be with you. So I know we have some uh, new parents, um, you know, just um, connecting to us for the first time. So we would love to, you know, to tell you more about us. So um, who are we? So we are glorious Christian children. Um, ministry so and um, we provide online platform where we teach children on bible and um, we do this online in the comfort of their home and we also organize um, bible quiz easter events summer events christmas events for children and we host online and offline um, intentional parenting workshop seminars hangouts and conferences like we are doing today and we also, finally, we do a uh, weekly three minutes reflective talk with our parents online. So you might be wondering, what are our aim? Why are we doing this? So our aim is to keep Christian children focused on God and godly things in this busy, perverse, and wicked world. To ensure that the word of God supersedes our informa um, other information our children you know, absorb daily. And to equip our parents with the necessary information that we enhance and aid their parenting journey like we are doing today, and to assist and support our parents in achieving some other goals. So, um, like I'm, I've mentioned, we use online uh, Zoom meeting for our classes. So this is how it looks when our children connect to our program. So um, about our online Bible club, because that is the, our primary assignment. So like I've mentioned, um, it is done online and um, the class date is Saturday, so we do this every Saturday. And um, the time is um, for the kids. We have seven to seven uh, to eight p.m. and our teenagers from eight p.m. you know to nine p.m. And what would they need for the class? They need their Bibles, their jotters, and pen. And we after the class, we do a class feedback and assignment. So our, uh, where we update our parents on our parent WhatsApp group. So um, yeah, um, for us to be able to have um. Any children, you know, in our in our club, we we need our parents' consent. So that is why uh, we can fully admit um, parents okay. whose children. Um, please, can you can you miss your audio? I don't know who's distracting them. Yes, audio. I'm on video. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, like I was saying, we need our parents' consent to be able to, you know, to admit their children into our, you know, into our um Bible club, and that is why we have set up that um parent WhatsApp. Okay. So it's not just anyhow on um, group um, platform. It's you know um, it just uh, is a platform where we give our parents you know informative, um, um, educative information and feedback about our children and all our programs. So and it's managed by the admin because from experience, I from you know my chat with other parents, I discovered that most parents they don't want to join you know. Um, they don't want to, they don't like to be connected to uh, anyhow WhatsApp group. So that WhatsApp group is not anyhow group, it's managed by the admin, so it's a closed group. So, and admin only, uh, you know, um, you know, post necessary information. 
So um, you might be wondering, like, uh, probably if there's anyone interested at the end of this program, like you want to connect your children to our uh, Bible club, so you can contact us through um, our number, phone number 0044756380354. And our email is on info at gloriouschristianchildren.com. So, um, well, so if you get in touch with us, we'll be able to advise you, you know, way forward, you know, on how to connect your children, you know, to our program. I uh, want to say a big thank you again for connecting. We pray may God be with you. So um, I will be handing over to our first speaker. Um, our dad um, um, in the Lord is one of our prospectors in Glorious Christian Children uh, Ministry. So uh, our evangelist, um, Ashaji. So over to you, sir. Thank you so much, parents. <laughs> It is my pleasure to be with you, and um, I'm happy uh, to be here again today. Uh, I want to appreciate the organizer of this program, uh, my beloved sister. I want to thank God for your vision and the genuine love you got for our, our children. Uh, it is my prayer that God we continue to move you forward in. Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let me also thank all those uh, speakers that are here today to share their uh, valuable experiences with us. May the Lord continue to increase your wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, I want to bless the name of the Lord for all the parents also that have joined and all our children too that are always uh, on this program. I pray that the Lord God Almighty will bless you and make you outstanding children in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, before I start, shall we just bow our heads uh, for prayer? Our Father and our God, we thank you. We worship you today because you are good. Thank you for everything you have done for us. We appreciate you. And we say, be exalted in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I believe you can hear me. Yes, yeah, sorry, sir. I muted you by mistake. Oh, ah, okay, because I can see. I, well, I believe everything is all right now. Yes, perfectly, sir. Okay. Uh, there is no better time we need to talk uh, on something like this than, than now. Uh, because if we look, into our society today, you will see that lack of good parenting uh, uh, skill is also responsible for all the societal decadences. And uh, I think these delinquencies among youth should call for a big concern, you know, in our society at large. Uh, this afternoon, have been asked to speak on uh, intentional parenting, God's mandate. Intentional parenting, God's mandate. Hmm. When we're talking about uh, intentional parenting, God's mandate, what do we really mean? Well, let me just put it simply uh, that intentional parenting is a way of inculcating some principles that encourages mindful growth in our children as commanded by God. It is a precious, long-lasting, intentional impartation of godly values and provision of spiritual guidance for our children. Uh, this is a task 
for both parents because uh, it is not that easy for uh, for one of the parents alone to achieve this and that is true i'm not saying that it is not achievable but it would be it would be a bit uh, cumbersome for a person to achieve this successfully so it is a joint thing it's a joint work that god is expecting from us as parents so intentional parenting involves the management of a child or children for future challenges for what they are going to come across in their later life when they are no longer under our roofs so and according to Amon, parenting skills are like any other skill you must practice them until it becomes a natural part of your being and you know we are in a changing world and we as parents we should you know be moving we should move with the trend of time we should not be left behind i understand the parents you know have a lot to attend to that's true but the issue of child upbringing should be paramount in our daily businesses we should add it to part of the things that we must do so intentional parenting is a big thing to god god values it because god is the giver of these children and we as parents we are just in custody of these children and we need to be very careful of what we do with them because either we like it or not we will give account to god who has given these children to us what we have done with them how do i know this that they are they are, they are the properties of god in psalm 127 if you go uh, and read the bible in psalm 127 verse number three the bible just says that behold children are heritage from the lord they are from the lord and god has given them to us to be in charge for him to take care of them for him so it is the will of god that godly instruction are passed down to these children as parents so intentional parenting is god's mandate and has not i mean he has not commanded us as parents uh, uh, not to to pass this down to our children god has commanded us to make sure that whatsoever that he has given unto us as, as he is must be you know released back to the children and uh, uh, if you go into the bible very well in the book of uh, deuteronomy uh, in chapter six of it if you read verses six and seven uh, it was there that god was telling moses to tell every children of israel about the law that he has given unto him and that is the law that we all know as a, as a, uh, the ten commandments he said to him in verse six and seven he said and you must commit yourself oh utterly to these commands that i am giving you today and he went for that in verse seven he says repeat them again and again to your children did you see what god is saying there repeat them again and again to your children not only that talk about them when you are at home you know that what god is saying that when you are at home with your children let them know about these commandments when you are on the road when you are going to bed and when you are getting up can you see god knows we will go we will go out with our children to those of you that takes your children to the park talk to them about the word of god even there on your way going junior have you read your bible today princess what the uh, john chapter 3 verse 16 says you see when you are going to bed bring them together thank god lead the prayer let them know that each time they are going to bed 
we will pray. I watched a film, the parents have not prayed, and they are telling the children to go to bed. They say, Mommy, we have not prayed. I say, Well done, good boys. Let them know. Talk to them when you go to bed and when you get up. In other words, the Bible is saying there is when you awake in the morning. There are so many of us who just wake up, wash, wash, wash up, do everything, straight to work. And before we come back in the night, the children are asleep. So for us to pray will be a problem. But the word of God is mandating us in this particular uh, uh, passage of the scripture. You know, to repeat the law of God again and again to our children. To talk about it when we are at home, when we are on the road, when we are going to bed, and when we wake up. So, one important God's mandate at, uh, in parenting that I would like to talk about uh, this afternoon uh, is a discipline and love. You see, discipline and love is meant to equip our children to function appropriately in the society. So, it then implies that if you or we as parents are going to discipline and love our child or children, we must be a disciplined and loving parent also. God is expecting us to be a disciplined parent. Most of us as parents, we are not disciplined. Yes, we are not disciplined, we are not loving. And we carry all this out in the presence of these children. Don't forget, what we practice in the presence of our children matters more. That is what they will carry along. There was a story of a boy uh, in the class. He was in the class and, you know, something happened between him and uh, another girl in the class. You know what he said to the girl? I will slap you the way my daddy used to slap my mom. Can you imagine? So he had been seeing it. So we need to be very, very careful what we do in their presence. So we too must be very disciplined. The truth, uh, the truth is intentional parenting skills are not taught at any university. You know, parents learn this skill through trial and error from their parents and information from published uh, sources. You see, uh, Michael Hammond he argues that our rules are basic to family life. It established the firm foundation for a disciplined plan. You see, rules are best when they are based on your family values and the standard you believe are important to follow. So such rules provide the moral compass that helps our children to find their ways. And according to Taylor, uh, he says love and discipline are key elements in the art of parenting and that discipline is a form of law. Therefore, parents should learn how to use it to avoid letting love for the child cloud the responsibility of parenting. There are so many of us, because we love our children, we don't want to discipline them. We don't want to, we don't want to correct them. And uh, I don't think that is a really good law. Uh, there was uh, a time from some few years, uh, very many years in Nigeria. Uh, one arm robber was to be uh, to be uh, uh, was to be shot to be uh, to be there, uh, killed. And before he died, before he, I mean, the, before he was shot, he, uh, he asked uh, the people to call his mother. He wants to talk to his mom. And when the mom came. He said he wants to whisper to her area that he didn't want everybody to, to know what they were saying. All of a sudden, he just put the hair of his mother in his, in his mouth and he chopped everything off. And people were wondering, why did you do this to your mom? And he, he said to the public, he said, while I was committing this little crime at home, my mom did not caution me. She kept papering me. She, did not, she never told me the end result. Did you see? She allowed her love for that child to cloud the responsibility of parenting. Uh, I, I, I don't want us to be like that. Uh, the Bible also shed more light. If you go to uh, 
Proverbs chapter 23, in verse number 13, the Bible says there, say, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. That's not to say that you, you should be abusive in correcting with a rod. If you do that, I will be the first person to call the police for you. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, when it comes to discipline, your primary concern should never be your own comfort. That is the truth. But the comfort of your child. You see, discipline or lack uh, or lack of it, it's a, it's, it is a thing that, you know, we need to think about very well. You see? We, I mean, it's a thing that we, we, we it is a thing that can set up a good or bad uh, chain reaction. So, uh, we must consider it very well. It is not, it, it has, it is double-sided. If your child or children don't respect rules, authority in the home, there is tendency that he won't respect authority in the school or even in the society. And, you know, discipline should begin sooner than later. When a child is old enough to, to, to be told uh, what to do or what is right and he chooses to do what is wrong, yeah, that child is ready for discipline. We must know that very well. And as long as, you know, your children or your child is under your roof or under your jurisdiction, I, let me let you know this. You will give an account to God for how you use or you didn't use your authority over the child or children. So God was talking about Abraham, uh, one of the Christian fathers of faith that we all look on to. In Genesis chapter 18, if you read in verse 19, he says, for I know him, that he's talking about Abraham, for I know Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, and the Lord uh, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham and which he had spoken of him. The Lord was 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 talking to people and telling others about Abraham. I know Abraham. God must be able to to, to say about you as parents. Yes, I know Mrs. So so so. I know Mrs. James. I know Mr. and Mrs. Robert, Robert, I know Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Johnson, that yes, they will take care of their children. Uh, one of our father in the Lord said, the reason Anna did not get a child on time was that she was asking for, uh, from God the child that will be sending on Nera. Ah, Lord, give me a child that I will be sending on Nera to, as Pedina is sending her own children on Nera. And God was not pleased with it, though it's, she was just saying something to let us know that sometimes we keep God at bay. But the moment you realize that these children are from God and you must take proper care of them, that was the day Anna realized that children are the heritage of God and she promised to return them back to God. That was the day that God gave her her own her child. So God can tell or God should be able to say about you that I know you, that you will train your child or your children in a proper way, in the way of the Lord. You see, uh, many parents understand discipline and punishment as equal or synonymous, although they are, in fact, different. And in many respects, they are opposite. Discipline is sometimes used to label what a parent punitively administer to a child and when it is actually punishment rather than discipline. So discipline is actually a learning experience that sets a behavioral limit and guidelines to help children progress successfully to adulthood. So discipline can be a positive experience, but punishment is almost always a negative experience with less desirable consequences. Discipline facilitates growth, learning, and a healthy sense of responsibility. So discipline teaches children how to raise self-esteem by taking responsibility for and control of their behavior. So the Bible in Proverbs 22, 
child, uh, verse 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. You see? And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So your parental function is to help train the child to develop independence in life and this starts from childhood to adulthood. The children need training that will help them to manage their own physical and emotional lives. According to Taylor, if parents choose their skills surrounding discipline in their formative years, they will be able to lovingly guide their children to adulthood without subjecting them to serious, irreversible traumatic experiences. So training a child the way you should follow does not mean you should mold them to your taste. One common blunder we make as a parent is trying to mold our child into what you know we used to be. Just because you are a doctor doesn't mean your children must follow after your school step. And just because you got uh, straight A's in your school, that does not mean your children is capable of doing the same. So why you know you should never tolerate or reward laziness. You need to accept that not all children are equally gifted intellectually. So try to make them into uh, what you want them to be is dangerous. You only need to help them to be what God wanted them to be. So don't try to relieve your life through your child. You know, you had your own chance and just because you didn't make it or make the grade in your chosen profession doesn't mean you should force your children, you know, in that direction. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. It is not necessarily the way you will want them to go. You see? So there are three hallmarks of healthy self-esteem you should continually strive to teach your children. And number one, they must know who they are. Know who you are. Number two, you must let them know that they must like who they are. Don't, don't be like any other person. Be who God has made you to be. And number three, like who you are. If you don't like, if you don't train them to like who they are, there will be problem in the, in the future. And this is what we need to do. Uh, before I, I ran up, uh, permit me to add the importance of uh, power of, uh, of prayer. You see, in intentional parenting, uh, you need to subject yourself to prayer and to pray continually for your children or your child and let them know too how to talk to God by themselves. So bringing yourself and your child before God for direction and instruction is very essential especially in this present society that has, it has every tendency to corrupt, to corrupt us and our children. So frequent engagement in prayer has a lot of part to play in, you know, uh, in our lives and that of our children. So I would like you to remember that the unruly children of today are the attic of tomorrow. And we parents stand guilty if our parental skill is defective leading us to discharging on big or half big young star into the society, projecting culturally and spiritually defective children into the next century. Uh, somebody once said, uh, mindful parenting is a need of the hour. So you are not just parenting, but programming. The program that you install will run in your child throughout his or her lifetime. So, don't install a virus in her or him. I once again want to congratulate our glorious Christian children for uh, hosting this important parenting workshop and uh, not only for the benefit of the children but also for our parents as well. And I also want to appreciate you for being a very good and wonderful listener. Thank you. May God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Let's laugh for Jesus. Thank you. God bless you, sir. So now Thank I'll be inviting um, Haron. Haron, are you ready? So Haron is our next speaker. So we'll be speaking on the strategic uh, communication between um, teenagers and, uh, and parents. 
So Aaron, uh, if possible, could you please unmute yourself so I'll be able to I'll be able to see you. Welcome aboard. Hi, Lola. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Very clear. Can you hear me? Yeah. How you doing? You're right. Okie dokie. All right, and people, first of all, uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. What I'm going to do is, I just want to quickly start it off with prayer, if that's okay, on my behalf. Heavenly Father, my sweet and wonderful Lord Jesus Christ, I glorify you, I honor you, I praise you. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity that you have allowed me to share with your children, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, to speak through me and guide me as I lead your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, then, people, just a little bit about myself, who I am. My name is Aaron Kent. Uh, my heritage is Uganda, East Africa. Uh, I was born and raised here in England. At the age of six, my parents divorced and my mother went back to Uganda. And while she was there, I was taken to Uganda. I was taken to a boarding school. In this boarding school, as you can imagine, 98% of the people there were my skin complexion, were black. But with me being the English boy, people would consistently say, English boy, get back to your country. They consistently tell me, you don't belong here. You're not one of us. So being born and raised in England, it was very weird to be surrounded by fellow black people who were telling me, who basically were, dis were discriminating me and making me feel like I am not comfortable and I'm not welcome in Africa, the continent which I thought belonged to me. At the age of eight, I came back to England. Well, during that time whilst I was in Uganda, the truth is, I hated it. I wasn't a fan of the food. Now I love the food. I wasn't a fan of the food, but also the majority of times, the teachers, as well as other students, I always felt like I was being suppressed, maybe because I was the so-called English child. When I came back to England, I wanted to live with my father, but my dad had remarried, and the person who he married had a son, and I wasn't able to live in the same household. Why? Because there just wasn't enough space. Between the ages of eight and 16, I remember feeling like I didn't necessarily have the attention put on myself. It was always put on my, whether it be my stepbrother or my other siblings. I always felt like I am not, apart from not getting the attention, I always felt like I wasn't necessarily always valued. My mom loves me and she did amazing. My dad loves me and he did amazing. But that's how I felt internally. At that age, I recognized, Aaron, there are two things you can do. You can begin to choose to resent your father. You can choose to blame all these circumstances and experiences that you have experienced so far, or you can choose to learn from them, use them to not just empower your mindset, but how to develop the lives of other people. By the time I was 15 years old, I had been to 16 different primary and secondary schools across London, where I was born and raised, Uganda and Manchester, where I currently live. My GCSEs, the weekend of my GCSEs, <laughs> I ended up getting chicken pox. And similar to the coronavirus right now, if you had chicken pox, if you do, they ask you to please stay away because it's contagious. I remember coming out with minimal GCSEs compared to what I was expected. because They said that I was in the so-called top sets and high grades. I did a BBC media apprenticeship. During this period, we, I was staying in a council house in Manchester with my mother and she told me, Aaron, if you make it through into the BBC, what I will do is I will keep this house for you instead of moving back down to London. From 300 people that were looking for the last 17. And I wasn't chosen, but I was told, Aaron, you're very articulate, you're very wise, you can definitely own your own organisations, but we can't put you through. As opposed to, again, me beating myself up, I decided, went back home to my mum and she said, son, I'm sorry, you can't, we can't stay in Manchester anymore. We have to move back down to London. Whilst I was in London, after two weeks, I received a phone call from a youth organization who told me that they've heard about me and they want to take me on. I asked them, would I be able to go to university? They said, sorry, it's a full-time course. I was like, all right then. I found out where they were based and they were based in Manchester. So at the age of 18, whilst all of my family live in London, I moved up to Manchester by myself. I worked for this youth organization and in the space of one month, I was promoted four times. During this period, when I was promoted four times, oh, I didn't express. At the age of 16, I did.
communicating with them is creating a safe environment. Creating a safe atmosphere. What do I mean? The majority of times, and maybe sometimes it is very typical of us as Africans where we feel it has to be like this, you have to do this, you have to do that. But in this generation of teenagers, but also in this generation of people, more, the majority of times when you're told you have to do this, just like every single one of us here, the chances of us wanting to do it are slim and we don't want to. And the way that I've managed to achieve great results with teenagers, and not only teenagers, also with adults and families that I work with and parents that I work with, it's creating that safe environment where people want to express how they feel. And the only way that can happen is if people, and now we're speaking about teenagers, if teenagers feel like you will value that which you are saying, which they are saying. So what do I mean? As opposed to coming, let's say your teenager has done something wrong or you're not necessarily happy with it. As opposed to first telling your teenager, why have you done this? You need to do this. You need to do that. Flip the script. Change it. Ask them why it is that they have done that which they have done. Take the time to understand them. As opposed to telling them, understand why they have acted in that way. Once you do that, a teenager is going to feel more open to express to you the truth. I heard the priest speaking earlier, which I completely agree with. When it comes to us, because we are born into sin, when we were conceived by our parents, because we're born into sin, naturally, there's certain things that we do, whether it be lying, whether it be stealing, various different things, which sometimes teenagers, they still carry even up to that age. And the majority of the time, they might not even recognize as to why they're doing it, but they're doing it because they feel it's, it's, it's just something to do. So what, when I state about creating that safe environment, giving them the opportunity to be honest, um, regardless whatever they're saying, whether you like it or not, whatever they are saying, choose to control your emotions. Choose to express to them, it's okay for you to express to me why you have done what you have done. Taking the time to listen to them. And when I do say listening, I'm not just talking about listening with your ears that, okay, yeah, I've heard you, but genuinely listening to them. Also with your body language, showing them that you're engaged in whatever it is that they're saying. Just like us, but also teenagers. If we put them in a position where we have shown them that it's okay for you to express how you feel, what they would do is you'll begin to see that the root of their issues, the root as to why they have said what they have said, is potentially far greater than what you may even think. And when you put them in a position where they feel comfortable to speak, they will then be more open to listening to you, your advice, your discipline, and your wisdom. As opposed to, as I said, as opposed to telling teenagers consistently, you have to, you have to, you have to, but why have you done this? Create the environment, reciprocity, give to them first. As the Bible does say, it's better to give than to receive. If we want to be leaders, the Bible clearly says the greatest leaders are servants. So serve your children by giving them the opportunity to express first. Something else that I was also asked about, when it comes to, when it comes to teenagers and putting teenagers in a position whereby we are communicating effectively with them, it's very important for us to show them the ways that we should communicate. What do I mean? If we are in a position whereby when we are unhappy with something, we're reactive, where we're expressing with our emotion, as opposed to using wisdom and also magic, our teenagers will begin to do the same thing. The majority of times, it's very easy for us to say, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. But a lot of times, and I'm presuming the majority of us here as well, whilst we were growing up and still growing up, it's easier to watch people's behaviors. So if you as a parent, are unhappy with your teenager for doing a specific thing, or maybe it's not even something bad. What if you're trying to encourage them, whether it be to revise? What if you're trying to encourage them to be more focused in life? What if you're encouraging them to not focus too much on boys or on girls, but you desire for them to focus more on their studies? You desire for them to focus on their relationship with God? You desire for them to focus on the maturity about money? The best thing to do is to get to the root of the issues as to why not, they are, why they're not doing what they're doing, but also setting that example, conversations with them. So for example, 
if it is, let's say you want to build up their relationship with God and you're trying to communicate to them, you're trying to effectively communicate with them why it's important to have a relationship with God. Wisdom would state, as opposed to telling them, this is what needs to be done. Wisdom would state, express your testimony. Express the importance of how God is to you. Express what God has done in your life, which will then create that curiosity where they want to find out more. If it's church, I remember growing up, my parents never used to go to church. We'd only go to church three times on three occasions. A wedding, someone's a wedding, some, when someone died, and a baptism. Those are the only times that we go to church. I began going to church and also giving my life to Christ because I was curious. I wanted to find out more. But when I was told, you have to, I didn't want to go. So again, even if it's, let's say, revision, and you're desiring to communicate in a way to, to help your teenagers, revise more. The best way to do it is by talking to them about their specific goals and targets. Find out what are their goals and targets. Stop telling them what you want them to do. Find out what it is that they desire to do in future. And then, using wisdom, you can then relate what they've said they want to do with homework. And bringing that connection together again no one likes to be told you have to do this you have to do that take yourself out of that position or else you'll be seen as yeah 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 the person who complains a lot you don't want to be in that position you effectively communicate with your teenagers by first understanding them if you don't understand them take the time to understand them once you have done that then you are in a position to communicate what it is that you wish and remember be mindful about the way you do communicate. As parents, as authority figures, we have got authority. But even the word warns us in Ephesians, fathers, parents, don't provoke your children. So we have to be wise with the way that we communicate. I remember growing up and I can speak openly and I've shared it many times with my dear earthly father who I love so much. Before I would be allowed to go and play football, before I was in a position whereby I could go out with my friends, he would say, you have to wash up. You have to do what? You have to do the dishes. You have to do all these things. And I was like, but dad, but dad, but dad. He said, I don't care. You have to do it. As I've grown up, and when I saw him doing a similar thing with my younger siblings, I then communicated to him and I told him, dad, the best ways to do it is to express in advance what it is that you want done. And if whatever it is that you desire isn't done, as opposed to getting upset and getting angry, have a conversation with them, with my younger siblings. Have a conversation. When I work with various families and also with teenagers, having a conversation with them, understanding their thought process as to why they do or don't do a specific thing. That's the best way. If I'm to give you clear bullet points, so number one, as I said, create a safe environment. After creating a safe environment, you choose to listen to them. That's number two. Number three, to have written down, Aim to understand them first, as opposed to trying to make your teenagers understand you first. You aim to understand them. It's better to give than to receive. That word in the Bible doesn't just say that when it's convenient to you because you're, you're, you're a powerful person. Forget all of that rubbish. You listen to them first. Jesus Christ, what he consistently did, he put himself out there for us first. When it came to feeding others, he served others first. So let us use that same wisdom. Let us aim to understand our teenagers first before they have to understand us. Number four, what I have stated is decide to talk to them from an understanding perspective. What do I mean? If I am trying to get a teenager who I work with to concentrate more in class, concentrate more in school, Instead of telling them, concentrate more in school, what I will do is I will first understand why they don't concentrate in school. Is it because they find the work too easy? Is it because they find the work boring? Is it because their dreams and aspirations aren't strong enough? In life and in all the life coaching that I do, it's very important, very important to relate people's emotions with their goals. If you can be emotionally strong enough to want to do something, the chances of you doing it are far greater than being told, knowing, okay, I need to do this. And that's the same way it is with teenagers. So speak to them 
from an understanding perspective. Number five, what I have put is speak to your teenagers firmly, but speak to them with love and make sure they are aware that you are also speaking to them with love. I'm presuming some of you may or may not be aware of the five different love languages. If you aren't, it's very important to go and research that. And some people think love language is only useful when it comes to a man and a woman or those type of relationships, but it also works with our teenagers as well. Some teenagers, you can speak to them and tell them something, but because they don't feel like you are showing physical love and affection to them, they're not listening. Some teenagers, you can talk to them and, I don't know, I don't know whether some parents still do or not, but you may, you may hit them or you may tell them, I'm going to beat you if you do this and do that. Some teenagers, that just doesn't work, especially in England and the world that we're living in. You hit them, they're calling the police and you know what the consequence will be. So the best thing to do is, again, understanding them. And the last thing that I've expressed is decide to communicate to your teenagers. Don't just talk to them. Don't just talk at them, but communicate to them. And once you've expressed your point, take the time to ask them if they've understood. Not telling them, but asking them. Ask your teenagers if they've understood. And one of the easiest ways to ensure that's done is by getting them to reiterate that which you have said to them in a way that they understand. When it comes to a lot of challenges and how to overcome a lot of challenges that parents face with teenagers nowadays, as I said, and another priest mentioned it earlier, it's very important to help teenagers understand who they are. Every single one of us, we behave in the way we do because we understand or we are trying to understand who we are. If a teenager understands that their background if the teenager understands that their future, if the teenager understands that the family that they come from is respected, if a teenager understands the place that they're trying to get to is worthy of them becoming a better person, then they shall. When I was younger, I never used to wear suits. But I used to always visualize myself wearing suits. Not because I just thought it looked cool, but I visualized myself wearing suits because I could see where I was going. Teenagers, it's the same situation. The way that I would speak when I was a teenager, everything was, yo, bruv, yo, fam, yo, yo, yo. And then I reached and I said, Aaron, where you're desiring to get to, consistently communicating in that way, that's not going to help you. And again, it comes back to the same situation with teenagers. Help teenagers understand who they are help teenagers understand their value remember i didn't say tell them but help them understand who they are help them understand their value once you do that that's the first stage for helping teenagers overcome the challenges that they face the second step to helping teenagers overcome the challenges that they face is looking at the issues help teenagers understand the root cause of the issues as opposed to the fruits of the issues. You understand the root cause of the issues by taking the time, again, to listen to them, question them, the things that they're not sure, the things that you're not sure about, the things that maybe they're not sure about. Question them. If it's, let's say, friendships, and the majority of their friendships are negative, as opposed to beating them up about it, ask them if the people who you're surrounding yourself with, are they going in the direction that you also desire to get to? If not, use wisdom and communicate to them in a way that will help them want to make that decision where they say, you know what, I don't want to continue on this path with these people because as we are aware, the five people who are consistently around, we become like them. If all five of them are millionaires, we become the sixth one. If five of them are, dare I say, drug dealers, we become the sixth one. If, six, if five of them are people who are focused and respectful, we become the sixth one. It's very easy and helping them understand that on their process. Again, it's never just telling them, this is what you have to do, but it's understanding them. And once you understand them, then you commun communicate. When it comes to, or shall I say the fourth thing, never discipline. So when it comes to over helping teenagers overcome their challenges and overcoming the challenges of teenagers, don't discipline the action. In 11 years of first working for a youth organization and starting up my own youth organizations and creating the services that I have, I've recognized that 
it's very easy. And many parents I work with, it's very easy for them to try to discipline an action. Because you've done this, here's the punishment. Because you've done this, you can't get the Pokemon. You can't. Don't discipline the action. Don't do it. Don't do it. The wisdom that a good man is best man, don't discipline the action. What you do is you discipline the understanding. Because if you discipline the action and the understanding is not there, they are going to go back and do the same thing again. When you discipline the understanding, again, help them understand, discipline the understanding, and that will prevent them from going back and doing that same action again. Don't discipline the action. Discipline the understanding. Some teenagers may do certain things and they don't really understand why they're doing it. In their mind, they feel that they're doing it because they see their friends doing it. They're doing it because they think it's the cool thing to do nowadays. That's, it's sad, but it's, it's, it's the truth. So as opposed to disciplining that, discipline their mindset. Once you have done that, it will be very easy for you to communicate your desires and your wishes on your teenager, which will then help them. And the last thing that I've put is help them on their journey. As parents, as adults, as authority figures, as people who genuinely care about teenagers, help them on their journey. Remember that you were also once a teenager and don't use that to beat them over the head with it, but use that to express to them, I was once there. Even though things may have been different, I was once there. I'm 29 years old. It was exactly 10 years ago that I was a teenager and I can already see some of the changes between some younger teenagers or teenagers nowadays compared to when I was a teenager. But the easy way to communicate with them is to express, I was once there. Yes, things were different, but I desire to help you on this journey. We shouldn't set an environment where it's just strict, where it's just authoritarian, where it's just discipline. We should set an environment of understanding, of choosing to listen, of being loving, and then directing, and then directing. What I have done is, um, I think this was six years ago, after working with, I think it was over 40 schools, um, over 10,000 teenagers, over, yeah, over 10,000 teenagers, roughly around over 10,000 parents as well, I recognize that not every teenager or parent directly has access to myself. So what I did do was I created an app which focuses on various different areas of improvement. I believe Jane will put it in the, in the link below. And it just covers various different elements on how to effectively get out of an altercation, the advantages of hard work, how to ask for help, taking the initiative, positive self-identity, overcoming loneliness, controlling anger, having ambition and aspirations. So this is an app that, that I've created to specifically help teenagers on their journey because I understand not every parent has the time. It's a list of various different topics and videos, again, help the teenagers. What I will be doing, I know that my time's up now, um, everyone who's able to go to the link or the website today, so again, Jerry will send you guys the links, uh, on Google, it is mindsetforsuccessapp.com. Whoever goes today, there is a specific discount that I have put out for the people of our community for today only, a further reduced discount. But Joe will send that out. Thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Let's clap for Jesus. Let's clap for Jesus. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for honoring you know our invitation. Um, I will send the links um, to our parents um, as soon as we complete this, and I will share this video on the YouTube. So uh, it, the link will be under the description for parents who are not part of Glorious Christian Children uh, family. So um, the next speaker is um, Mrs. Fumiuni. So are you ready, man? Welcome on board. So. Hello, Ma. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We can't see your face, ma'am. Uh -huh. right. Good afternoon, um, Sister George. Thank you so much for inviting me. And what a pleasure to listen to you, Aaron. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I have made a lot of notes. 
some things to take away, and I believe um, our parents have done so as well. And um, thank you, Evangelist, as well, for teaching us earlier on today. Truly, truly, truly grateful. Um, yeah, so my name is Fumioli. Um, I run Gordium, Gordium Coaching and Counseling Services um, here in the UK. And um, a little bit about my background. So I have a similar background to Aaron, um, to Aaron. So I was nodding my head away when you were talking about your history, you know. I was born here, my parents took me back to Nigeria, and um, I felt the same way, you know, people back in Nigeria would think, ah, oh, where, who is this one? Why is she talking this way? You know, she, you know, she talks funny. And coming back to England, I don't speak either. So I'm neither Nigerian and I'm neither British. Who am I? Well, I am um, a Zionite. <laughs> so thank God for Jesus, you know. I'm truly, truly grateful for, for you sharing that um, information with us. So it does put a lot of things into perspective. But today, I am going to be sharing on career development and transition. And I'm quite passionate about it because like so many people, what I found is, especially from African background, our parents tell you you need to become a doctor, a lawyer, you need to become, you know, you know, all the prestigious, uh, profession and so I ended up with an economic degree which after a while I thought no this is not me I'm not passionate about it at all but my dad wanted me to become an accountant you know <laughs> so I did ICA. Um but I realized no this is not who I am there's no fulfillment there's no passion nothing at all um, but God in his infinite message connected me with um, with some people where I, by the grace of one year, I volunteered in a non-governmental organization where we looked after women. And that was where I became, I came in contact with what I was naturally born to do. And that is to encourage and support people along their journey in life. And that's why today I'm so excited that I'm going to be speaking about career development and career transition. I'm going to share my slides, hopefully, um, within this short period of time that I have. Um, right, I'm unable to share my screen. Um, would you be able to help me with that? Yeah, I've made you the host now, so you can share now. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. All right, so um, this is me. Okay, so I think I'm just taking a little bit of time to come up. Right, okay. So um, I'm going to be talking to us, or hopefully encouraging and challenging us as parents. We've heard a lot about children, how we need to raise our children, how we need to support our teenagers. But now I'm going to bring you back to us as parents. You know, one day our children will grow and they will live in us. So all the time and energy that we have spent pouring into them, when they leave, where would we be in terms of our career? What will we be doing with our time? Unfortunately, a lot of people leave this side of their life to focus on their children, they leave their career, they leave their, you know, their own um Thing that they should be doing. God said we should be fruitful, you know, not just in the area of child um, rearing, but also in terms of our own career, we need to be fruitful. So a lot of us, we do leave that part of ourselves, and when our children are grown, we are, um, we, there's nothing for us to do. And unfortunately, some parents divorce after 34, 35 years of marriage because they've neglected their relationship with their spouse. They've, really, they've neglected their own career, you know? So you find out, and, and it's quite sad, you find that after 30, 40 years, people are divorcing, and you're thinking, what on earth? The other day I heard about um, uh, McDonald's, um, Trevor McDonald leaving his wife for 34 years. You know, you hear about this, you know, it's quite disheartening, and it's because we fail to pay attention to the things that matter most, you know? Um, to, to us. 
So we're going to be looking at how do we go from where we are to our desired future. So the first thing that we need to do, if you are not currently in a place where, you know, you are enjoying um, satisfaction, where you're happy, you know, if you, if you are one of those that wake up in the morning and you're just going to, you know, pick the book to get money to pay bills. Um, life is more than just paying bills. We should enjoy our work. We should enjoy the things that we do on a daily basis, aside from parenting, you know. So this is the thing that we're going to be talking about. We're looking at career. Um, My screen is a bit frozen, and I don't know why. Okay. So what do I mean by career development? It is a lifelong, it's a lifelong process. Now, with career development, it's not something that you wake up in the morning and you think, okay, in five years' time, I'm done, I'm just dead. It's what you do throughout your working life. And some people, even up to retirement, because they're so passionate about what they do, even after retirement, you still see that they still carry on doing what they're doing. Maybe on a lesser note, not as um, busy and as intense as it used to be in their heyday, but because it's, it's their life, they just love it, you find that they continue to see what they're doing. So when we talk about career development, we're looking at what we need to do so that we can retain our relevance in our chosen field, so that we can advance and we reach our goals in terms of our career, okay? And, um, and it's quite a beautiful thing that we are Christians, and Christians, I would say, see who much is given, much is expected, okay? So if you have been given something, and we all know that we all have a talent, we all have seeds that God has planted in us, he expects it to grow, he expects you to flourish, okay? So we need to find out what that is if you are not there already, okay? So career progression, on the other hand, talks about us moving up the ladder in our children's field, okay? I've given an example here of a medical student, you know, who aims to become a general practitioner. If you're a medical student, you want to start out, your goal is to become a practitioner. So how do you get to where you want to get to? It's important that we learn how to map that out as people. And that's just an example. Whatever your chosen career is that you have decided that you want to do, you need to map it out. And transition. Hmm. Now, I spoke about myself that I started out as an economic student, graduated from economics. Um, rather than 2002. After a while, I realized that this is not all what I wanted to do. I needed to change my career. Okay? So career transition talks about that period where you want to change your role. Maybe even in your organization, you might have started out as an administrative officer. And you realize, oh, there's more to me. I like numbers. I like figures. I want to become an analyst. You know? <clears throat> so it talks about you changing. It talks about change from what you used to do into something entirely different. And that would uh, map out, it has to do with your passion and what your vision for life or the vision of God that God has given to you. Okay. <clears throat> so how do I move from where I am to where I want to be? Either by either growth, development, um, transition. You need to assess yourself as parents or has these young people, we need to assess ourselves. What do I mean by assessing? Know who you are. And it's interesting that Emmanuel talked about this earlier on as well. When he was talking, I was like, yeah, um, thank God for the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, we need to know who you are. Who are you as a person? What interests you? Okay? And how do you know that? Um, I use them what I call a value system. So there's a list of values that I have when I'm working with my clients. Um, so you want to know what you love to do naturally. Are you someone who is moved by compassion? Are you someone who, you know, you just, you, you're just thinking about money. The thing about money is not a bad thing in itself. What do you want to do with the money? Um, are you someone who, you know, you want power? 
what desiring power is not wrong. And um, what do you do with the power? You know, you want to help your oppress. You know, what are those things that you see in society that draws your attention? You know, that, you know, presses a button in you. You know, some people might come into a house, for example, and the first thing they see is colors. They're like, wow, they have to share the colors in the building, um, in, in the house. Some, another person might just come in and just, you know, they, they're um, oblivious to the colors. But the, but the person who attention has been drawn to those colors might be an interior designer, you know? So you know what interests you. And I want to speak to our friends and our witnesses. I used to analyze a lot when I'm assessing clients. Um, you want to know what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are. And you want to also be able to know what opportunities are there out there that can speak to your strengths. Um, you want to know those things that are threats to you, you know, with regards to either transitioning or developing your career as a person. And um, Aaron talks about um, the, the love language. I talk about um, your personality here. You know, you need to know yourself. Are you a naturally outgoing person? Are you sanguine? Are you melancholy? You know, are you someone who is, um, you know, you want to make sure that all the T's are dot, uh, crossed and all your eyes are I got it, you know, I used to like much like you want to know your personality um, as an individual. Um, we are, God has created us uniquely. We are all unique human beings and we are all created to do various things, you know. Um, and then your ambition. It's important that you know what are those things. And when we're talking about ambition, you know, you ask the questions of why. Why do you want to do what you want to do? Is it because a lot of people are doing it? And that's another thing that is so popular in, in, in our locality. Someone opens a shop and everybody wants to open a shop. You know, someone is selling something and everybody's rushing to sell that thing because it's making money. You know, what, what are those things that are unique to you? Why do you do what you want to do? Who are you doing it for? How do you want to do it? You know, these are questions that you need to ask yourself whilst you are assessing yourself. Okay? Now, faith is important. Um, God created us all for a purpose, you know. Um, so in you deciding what career you want to work in, and can I ask, tell us that um, age is not a barrier, you know. Um, a lot of people that I work with, especially we work with people, and some people are like, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm too old to start that now. Um, I'm in my 50s, I'm in my 40s. Age is not a barrier. If God could use Philip, you know, he can use, he can start with you. If God could start with Moses when he was well over 40, then how much do you? So if you feel the things you're doing, you know, the kind of role that you're in, at the moment, it's because, you know, a lot of us, we, we find ourselves doing the same role. Maybe you came into the country and the people that you met were all doing um, care jobs. There's nothing wrong with care jobs, but if you're not passionate about it, you're only doing it because you know you need to pay your bills. Um, then you need to step back and ask yourself these genuine questions, right? Don't consider the... Um, your age. Don't think you're too young, neither don't think you're too old. Trust God. You know, trust God that God is able to do. He's able to do the exceeding, the abundance. He's able to take it from where you are to where he wants you to be. You know, so it's important that if you call yourself a child of God, then let's behave like a child of God that we are. Let's put our faith into action. Okay? That, and I'm not even saying that we should stop where we don't 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 stop your job. No. Keep doing your job, but then start something by the side. Start start something by the side. Um by the grace of God I was working with the council, I think, when I went back to school and I started studying. And there are a lot of things out there, you know, that we can 
avail ourselves of. So hold, if you, you know, if you know the God that is just hold on to him and start where you are, start now. Right, you can uh, my screen keeps See, sorry about this phone. Okay. Right, we're going to go to our roadmap, and that talks to us about our options. What are the options that you have? So you've done your self-assessment, right? You know what your strengths are. You know what your weaknesses are. You know the things that you match. Now let's look at the options that you have. Okay, look at the industry trend. There's no point um, going into something where there's no demand, right? So you need to understand the laws of supply and demand. Um, and then educational path, right? If you need to upskill, upskill. And it's so nice at this season, at this time where, yes, unfortunately we have the pandemic, but there are a lot of resources out there now in terms of certification. So you don't need to go into back to school to do, well, if you have to, then by all means do. But there are also other short courses that you can do that can help you to increase in knowledge. Now, if you are, if you have a degree, for example, and you are competing with this generation Z, <laughs> you know you need to appeal because our world is constantly evolving. The things that are relevant yesterday are no longer relevant today, okay? Cars, I use cars as an example. We all, there was a time where having a car was a luxury. Yeah, if you had a car, you know, you must be earning a lot of money. And then we move from having manual cars to having um, automated cars. Yeah, so people move into automated. And then now you have the electric cars and things are constantly evolving. I was thinking about my, you know, growing up, when my parents were going out to work in the morning, they would cook our lunch. They will put it inside warmer, you know, so you get back from school, you get your food in a warmer. Now, who has a warmer in the house today when there's a microwave, you know? So we have to make sure that our skills are relevant with this type, okay? And your work environment also, you know, where do you want to work in? Do you want to have your own business? Do you want to work in an organization, you know? Think it out and map what you want to really do. Dream, you know. God has given us the ability to dream dreams. So let's dream dreams and trust God that God would make all things work together for our good as we begin to map out our career. Right. So we talked about here our action plan, which is the thought um, pie chart. Action plan. So now you know what you want to do as an adult, uh, sorry, so as a parent, or as an individual, you know what you want to do in terms of your career. How do you get there? It's important that you work with people who are like minded. A lot of people will, will put you down, a lot of people will discourage you. You know, some people are like, ah, at this age, you want to do this. No, you need to work with people who will cheer you on, people who would champion your course, people who would encourage you, who would motivate you, okay? So it's important that you make your decisions, you set your goal. In 10 years' time, this is where I want to be. You know, God, when God created this world, he placed the seed of a thing in a fruit. He started with the end in mind. And that's the God that we said. He started with the end in mind. So he didn't plant creators a tree and say, okay, this is going to be an apple. No, he created that seed of the apple or the seed of or in the fruit. Okay? So when people say, oh, I don't have a five, ten years, I don't know, you have to work by faith. That in ten years' time, this is where I want to see myself. This is what I want to achieve with my life in ten years' time and actively set long 
medium plus 10 goals. And it is SMART. SMART is an acronym for um, specific. You need to be specific. You need to know what it is you want to achieve. You need to be measurable. You need to be able to achieve that goal. Um, it has to be realistic and it has to be time bound. Okay? And prioritize. I have a matrix called an audience, not audience matrix. Right, so when you're prioritizing, you need to know which ones are urgent, which ones are important, but not urgent. What I have found is that a lot of times, the things that we really need to do are those things that we procrastinate. Okay, those things that we need to do that, that would really make an impact, we leave it to the last minute. And then we start doing the things that we think are urgent, phone calls. You know, thank God for social media and the like. You know, they take up so much of our time. So much. You'd be surprised the amount of time that we spend on social media, <laughs> checking someone's um, update. You know, sometimes you just want to check something and the next thing it leads to another, another. Before you know it, 30 minutes of your time is gone. Never to. <laughs> To come back again. One hour is gone. Ask some plan. So investigate what matters by asking your investigative questions and then do a reality, uh, reality check. So at every junction, check how far have I gone? Am I still, you know, on uh, uh, route? Am I still doing the things I said I was going to do? Um, and then the last thing is how do I get there? How do I get to where I want to get to? Personal, career branding, job searching, networking. Networking is important. Um, I use LinkedIn. There are a lot of networking um, platforms out there that can actually help us. Um, applications, it's a good thing that if there's someone that is going to be speaking to us about that today. And work experience. One of the things that helped me to get to where I am now was volunteering. Volunteering. Um, I volunteered, and it was in Nigeria, where it's not so common. So every you you're thinking about money. Everything is not money. I had the opportunity to volunteer, and I I, I didn't even think that I didn't think that it, it was um, a waste of my time at all. But I I realized I enjoyed doing it. I did it for for a year. Um, helping young women, you know, destitute, and some of them are even into prostitution, just helping them to get off what they're doing and to uh, draw themselves on some training, you know. And, and that really opened my eyes to counseling. It opened my eyes to coaching, which God helped me to do later on. So if there is something that you think you want to do, volunteer. Volunteer your, 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 your services, you know, because you are giving and you are getting. I know Pastor said it's more blessed to give than to receive, and that's so true. Because in your giving, you, you, you're adding a lot of value to yourself, consciously or unconsciously, okay? Uh, mental, and then, yes, it's important. If you can, avail yourself of the service of a coach. Avail yourself of the service of a coach. Uh, because what coaches do, they hold your hand, they encourage you, they cheer you on. Um, and they're not, 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 not judgmental at all. You know, they are there to support you. you they are there to um, help you so that you are accountable to someone. Okay? You are accountable to someone. That person is asking you, have you done your action point? Have you, you know, and that helps you to make progress. So this is the whole thing that I've just spoken to us about in a nutshell. From self-assessment, your options, your action point, and your evaluation. So you want to know who you are as a person. You want to know what your options are. You want to know how do you get there, you know, and when will you get there. You know, what I would say is, well, someone, I'm going to paraphrase now, would this start? Um, a building without first counting the cost. Okay, so 
First, you want to know that you make sure that you are faithful. You make making use of the thing that God has given to you because God is going to ask you what have you done <laughs> with the resources that I have given to you. I always like to say to God as a businessman, you know, he has invested in us. He's expecting something back. Okay? So he's going to ask us, what have you done with your talent? He's not going to listen to the excuses that, oh, I was busy looking after the children. So, yes, he expects you to do that. But also he has given you the grace to stress. He has given you the grace to do. And he has made available the resources that you would need to do. Okay, opportunity when it needs preparation, there will be an explosion. But if there are opportunities and we are not prepared to make use of those opportunities that God is making available to us, then we only have ourselves to blame. You know, so it's important as parents, as young people, that we make use of all these things that God is giving to us. Um, and finally, in wrapping up quickly, I think my time is going. Obstacles. I'm just going to quickly talk us through the obstacles to carry development and possible solutions. One, lack of idea. Mm, I don't know what I want to do. Do yourself assessment. It will help you. Okay? So being aware of your own strength is important. And you must get goals. Okay? If you aim at nothing, what would we what happen? If we aim at nothing, we will achieve nothing. Okay? And inability to take risks is another one. Your thoughts drive action. So when you change your thoughts, your actions will naturally follow suit. Okay? So it's important that we change our mindset. Stop believing that you can't do it. And stop believing. Start believing in the world that you carry every day, that God has given you the way to do the above and the beyond. I don't have the qualification, experience, I just explained to us, volunteer if you can, of skill. There are lots of certification programs out there that you can avail yourself of. Let's make use of that. Um, I've not worked in a long period of time. Voluntary work can also help in that area. When you volunteer or you do some side hustles, if you get an opportunity to, you know, to be interviewed for a job, you can explain what you've done in the brief time that you haven't done anything. You can say, oh, you've been doing X, Y, rather than say, oh, I've just been waiting, I've been searching, I've been just pointing. Thank you so much for listening to me today. God bless you all. Wow. Thank you, Margot. Let's laugh for Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Ma. Well, we've learned a lot from you. God bless you, Ma. Thank you. So, our parents, this slide will be available um, to us. Um, and if you are not, um, if you've not joined our parent group, so um, you can do not hesitate to get in touch with me or speak with whoever has invited you so that I can, you know, send you this um, information. So, thank you. So, the next person, uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Lola Ayobaye. <laughs> so welcome on board, Ma. Um, yeah, I can't see yet. Okay, good. Good to have you, Ma. Hello, good everybody. Hi. Good evening or good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. It's um, it's, it's lovely to be here, and thanks for inviting me. So I'm going to be speaking about writing a CV that sells, and um, it's writing an effective CV, but the truth is our CVs are a sales document. So I'm just going to share my screen because I've got it as a presentation. So I hope that um, you will find this very valuable. It says that the host has disabled screen sharing, so I think you'd have to... Yeah, I need to make you the host. Allow oh. me to do that, yeah. <laughs> So, um, some for me, do you want to make <laughs> Dr. Lola the host? It's a, it's a very different world now. We all have to get used to doing so. things specially. It takes some getting used to. Yes, you are now the host, so you can share. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I 
Okay, so like I said, we'll be talking about writing a CV that sells. My name is Dr. Lola Ayongbayi, and I'm just going to sh go to slide screen, um, slide share. What is this thing? Yeah, great. So a little bit about me. I'm an engineer. Well, I was an engineer. <laughs> I have become a professional book editor a proofreader and a writing consultant, which is probably why I'm, you know, taking this session on CV writing. I've got a PhD, I am an author, I've authored a book and I've got two more in the, pipe, in the pipeline. Um, the name of my book is Catch It First, How to Edit and Proofread Your Own Writing and it is available on Amazon as an ebook and as a printed um, book as well if you do the Amazon print on demand. I recently started my own publishing company and it's called BLA Stories and I've just shared the logo there so in case you see it somewhere you'll be like hmm this looks familiar oh it's that lady so I put that there for recognition and I am the founder of Write Better Africa which is a Facebook community that helps sub-Saharan Africa, African um, adults learn how to write better and again that is our logo so for recognition if you see it anywhere I hope you're able to connect the dots I am married and I am a mom. I've got two lovely children. So that's just a little bit about me and we move on. So let's get straight into it. What is a CV? I'm sure everybody here knows what a CV is, you know, but um, just out of formality, out of tradition, I will say what a CV is. So a CV is the curriculum and it is a short written description of your education, qualifications, previous jobs, and the like, and it also sometimes contains your personal interest, which you send to an employer when you're trying to get a job. Now, I think for me, the most important thing is that a CV is a sales document. Do you know that there's research that says that um, employers only spend about 8.8 .8 seconds on each CV that comes to their desk or that gets you know to them okay these days maybe not not desk maybe that comes into their emails or whatever platform it is they're using but my point is nobody has time to look through your cv and pick out the fine details you need something that grabs the attention and that makes them think hmm, i want that lady i want that gentleman to be at the interview i would like to find out more so a CV is a sales document and of course what you're selling is yourself. You want to think about how can I get this prospective employer's attention. My number one um, tip would be that think about the benefits. What do you bring to the table? Don't think about the features. Okay, so I have a PhD and so what? A PhD is useless in itself or by itself. It is what, it is the benefit of having a PhD that I must be able to sell to my prospective employer that would help me get booked for an interview. You know, and obviously then you start to think about, when you get to that stage, you start to think about how to get them to employ you. But the first hurdle to cross is making sure that your CV attracts enough attention to get you an interview. So one good way of doing this is to always make sure that everything in your CV counts. So today I'm not going to be teaching us about, or, um, about um, writing a CV in itself. I'm not going to say, okay, so at first you put this on top and then you put that next. Google is there, you know. I, I don't believe in resharing information that is a dime a dozen. But what I want to do today is I want to point you towards certain things that you can watch out for, that you can pay attention to, to make sure that your CV stands out and that you get the kind of attention that you need to help you get an interview, okay? So you want your CV to paint a picture and you want to be able to answer that question, and so, or and so what? So um, I'm an engineer, and so what? Tell us what being an engineer brings to the table. So I'm a nurse, and so what? Tell us what being a nurse brings to the table. That is what, you know, your CV should be about. It should sell you. It should paint a picture in as short a time as possible. So there are several types of CVs, and I'm just going to touch on these because it's important that you know. So we have the traditional CV, which is the chronological one, which tends to follow the order in which your experiences occurred. This is like 
a very um, versatile CV. It's used across industries. I mean, if you have never written a CV before and you have to write a CV, you would most likely be writing a chronological CV, okay? Now, I will talk more about the differences on, um, in the next slide. The next um, type of CV is the functional one, which is based on your skills and achievements. So you don't want to focus so much on ex the experiences you have for different reasons. Maybe you have gaps in your CV or in your work history rather, or maybe you feel that you don't have enough experience that but you have you know, a lot of skills that you can use in the, in, in the role that's been advertised. Then in that case, you want to do a functional CV. And then there's a bit of both the combined CV, which tends to be long because obviously for you to write, you know, for you to choose to write a combined CV, it is likely that you've got a lot of experience as well as a lot of skills and achievements and you just want to put both of them, you know, in that document. Now, remember that I said, you know, people don't have time to really, really look through your CV. So in many cases, less is more when you're creating a CV. So when are these CV types relevant? For the chronological CV, if you've got a lot of experience in a particular industry and you want to demonstrate or you want to show, you know, whoever is hiring that, or oh, you have grown, you know, that you've, you've progressed, that you worked your way up to where you are now, you know, for different reasons. I want to share this for different reasons. You might want them to be able to deduce that you're dependable and reliable and that you've got that staying power and all of that, okay? Chronological CV is also useful if there are no gaps in your work history. So if you've, you know, you didn't take a break to look after the kids, you didn't um, take a break because you went to uni and all of that, you can use a chronological CV. If you're seeking a better position for in-house applications, so maybe you're moving for, you, you, you want to move from HR to some other department or vice versa, a chronological CV is the way to go. And then if you want to focus on the at, um, organizations you've worked for, so say you're changing companies, but you want to demonstrate that, oh, or you want to show rather that you've worked with some prestigious companies and you want them to see that, you know, this is what you've done for those companies and this is the length of time spent with those companies, then again, a chronological CV is your best bet. Like I said, it is the most popular type. It is the traditional type of CV and it is what most people would default to. Now, for the functional CV, there are times that you, um, for different reasons, like I took quite a bit of time to have my kids and to look after them. So it, my CV at some point was functional because for me it was about bringing, showing, you know, that I had skills and I had achieved things in my previous jobs. So if you want to show that you have the skills for a job, even though you don't have a lot of experience, your functional CV is the way to go. If you have gaps in your work history, like I've already said, it is the way to go. If you're changing and have demonstrated that I'm able to use the skills in the right way, but I don't have the experience. Then I'll use a functional CV, you know, and I will showcase the aspects that provide evidence that I can use these skills, okay? And then for entry-level roles, again, for the same reason, you don't have experience. Maybe you're fresh out of uni or for whatever reason, you didn't get on the, um, on the employment ladder. That's the word I was looking for. You didn't get on the employment ladder early enough and you want to start working. So for example, if you were a stay-at-home mom before and your kids are grown and you want to start working, but for with the experience you have, you know that you can only seek entry-level roles, then you want to use a functional CV because then you begin to think, what skills do I have? What can I bring to the table? What transferable skills do I have? You know, and then you focus more on what you can do as opposed to what experience you have. The combined CV is pretty much easy to figure out. You know, like I said before, you want to show that you have the skills and experience for, the, for a job. You have a lot of experience and achievements in a particular industry. And most times the people that have this kind of experience, this, um, this, um, the people that have this level 
this level of experience and skills and achievements are usually people in managerial positions, you know, people that have been there for years, have worked their way up the ladder and are wanting to apply for executive roles and the like. So I'm going to be focusing on some aspects of, you know, your CV, the cut across the three CV types, okay? And the, it is important that what goes into these areas or these parts of your CV sells you. Many people feel daunted, you know, when it comes to writing CVs. It feels like such a chore. They just can't wait to. So if when they put all the things they, they, they need to put down, they kind of heave a sigh of relief, forgetting that it's not just about writing stuff on paper and having something to show that this is the school I went to, this is where I've worked. Forgetting that it's not about that. Forgetting that there are a thousand and one other people that will be applying for the same jobs, you know, and would also be bringing something unique to the table. They forget all of that and send in those CVs and don't get a response. Why? Because you haven't made a difference. When you're writing your CV, think about difference. Think about standing out. You need to do something that would attract the right attention. So one area that cuts across all CVs is personal details. You must provide your personal details. We all know that to be your name, your phone number, your address, and your email. But so many CVs leave it at that. So I'm asking a question today. Is that all? Guys, that is not all, okay? You need, in, in today's world, social media has come to stay. You cannot pray it away, okay? The world has evolved. Social media has come to stay. And interestingly, employers want to know that when they employ you, or let me put it this way, employers want to be able to gain some insight into who you are. So it's now beyond, oh, um, she has the right qualifications, she has the right experience. They want to understand your temperament. Will you be a good fit for the team? You know, what are you like? Are you aggressive? Are you gentle? Are you confident? These little soft skills, so to speak, do you speak well? You know, are you reliable? Would you abscond from work because you had a bad experience previous day? You know, they want to know if you're resilient or they, they want to be able to pick on your soft skills. And for a lot of employers these days, in fact, I would say for all employers these days, it's not enough to just say that you do those things. They want to be able to feel for you. So in today's world, your social media profiles play a huge role. Something tells me that somebody's thinking, hey, how can I put my Facebook um a link to my Facebook profile in my CV. Yes, you can, but you don't have to put a link to your Facebook profile. You can put a link to your Facebook page. So that brings me to what kind of social media profiles am I talking about? You want social media profiles that would demonstrate, you know, that you are not afraid to be in a world that is diverse and that is digital. LinkedIn, and LinkedIn shouldn't just be, you know, a platform for dumping your CV. No, LinkedIn should be a platform where you can tell a story about yourself, the kind of posts you share, the kind of comments you make, and all of that. I'm sure all of us here are parents, so we know that you there's something called online etiquette. So you don't go online and misbehave because you don't know who's watching. Every time you're online, you're leaving a digital print. So we, we pay attention to all these little things and we make sure that when people just randomly Google your name, they are proud of what they see or they are assured, depending on what the, the purpose of um, Googling your name is anyway, they are assured of what they see if in, in, in the case of a prospective employer. You know, so you want to talk about, you want to leverage LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the number one professional platform in the world. So you want to leverage it. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I suggest that you create one. You now begin to engage, look for people in the field you want to work in or in the field that you are working in and begin to connect. And from time to time, I'm not saying spend all your time on social media, but from time to time, you know, comment, let people have a feel of your personality because someday when somebody wants to employ you, um, employ you, yeah, they might just check you out, okay? There's another platform called about.me. Now, about.me um, simply is some sort of digital CV, if you like. It's, it um, allows you to create a free 
I wouldn't call it a website, but a free profile. Yeah, that's more apt. A free, a free profile, you know, where you put a little bit about you. Like my own about.me page links to my website, okay? So if somebody, um, if I share my um, about.me link anywhere, so in this case, if I shared it on my CV, they will just copy and paste that into their browser and check me out. It leads to my website. And on my website, they can have a feel for who I am. My social media handles are on my website, you know, and then they can click that and gain more insight into my personality. Please, guys, be careful what you do on social media. Don't just um, delve into any sort of argument with anybody. Don't get into conversations that are not edifying. You know, don't get into conversations that would bring out the wrong side of you. Be very intentional and strategic because you don't know where your presence or what your presence on social media will do. I don't know how far it can take you. Now, this is a personal opinion, but when it comes to establishing yourself on social media for professional reasons, my first a recommendation will be LinkedIn for obvious reasons, then about.me, only because a lot of people don't know about it yet. Instagram, because everybody knows that Instagram is a business hub. Facebook page, not profile. So your profile is a personal one where people ask to become your friends. Your Facebook page is your business page, so to speak, and you can create one, you know, for yourself. You don't have to be a business. You know, you can just choose why you are creating uh, excuse me, sorry, that's one of my numerous alarms going on. Okay, sorry about that. So you would um, just create a, a Facebook page that suits your purposes, put the relevant information there, you know, with the mindset that, hey, I probably will be applying for a job soon. And then Twitter, I'm not very familiar with Twitter. It's just one of, even though I have an account, it's just one of those platforms that I don't click with. And so I hardly go there. I only go there when, you know, somebody tags me or something like that. Now, the next area to fo that I will be fo focusing on this evening is your personal statement or profile. Now, I'm sure most of us have seen that um, short paragraph. It's usually about five or six lines, you know, and it typically starts with stuff like this, a motivated and driven individual looking to gain experience within the engineering se sector or whatever. <laughs> this is another one. I'm, I am an experienced and dedicated healthcare assistant looking to further my career in blah, blah, blah. I'm sure we've all seen those kind of personal statements or profiles. Now, they're not always needed, especially if you're writing, a, if you're going to write a cover letter, there's no need repeating information. More so, nobody has time. Remember, the goal is to catch the attention and secure an interview, and then you can go and wow them at the interview, okay? So, next page or next slide. Now, remember that I said that you want to sell your benefits, not your features, right? I crossed this out because it is the wrongest way of writing a personal statement. Hey, at this stage, you're, you're, the, the, the person hiring, the prospective employer doesn't even know who you are. You're just one amongst many. They've got no obligation towards you. You know, so why should they care about the fact that you're looking to get experience? Why should they care that you're looking to further your career? No, they want to know what you bring to the table. Now, erroneously, a lot of people think, oh, it will show that I'm an ambitious person and I'm, you know, I'm ambitious. I want to grow in my career and that would, you know, make them hire me because they would think that, oh, because I want to grow, I would not leave the company on time and all of that. Hey, nobody has time to do all that thinking for you. They want to know what um, what am I going to get from you being in my company, okay? So a better way to write a personal statement or profile, you can write a personal statement or profile in any way that, you know, is relevant to your industry. You can write it in third person, you can write it in first person, you know. So a third person will be this first ex example that is a motivated and driven individual. So you are talking as if somebody is the one talking about you. The first person is you are saying that you are something like the second example. But now about what I bring to the table, you tell them what you are bringing to the table. So I put an example here, which says, 
to add real commercial value. Okay, so for example, if you look at if if we reword that first line as read and um, read it as a motivated and driven driven individual looking to add real commercial value to this engineering company with a view to helping them achieve blah 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 in their um, sales objectives or whatever it is you know I'm sure you get the drift. Now, for me, I would say that the key question you should be asking yourself when you're writing your personal statement, you know, is that what is important to the organization I want to join? So I've seen this company, I'm desperate for a job, and I've seen this company, you know, what is important to them? You have to put that desperation aside and think, stop thinking about yourself, because the truth is the, the, the prospective employer doesn't care about you. They care about what you bring to the table. So you think, what is important to them? And that is where research comes in. You cannot be applying for a job that you have not researched. Research should not be done just when you've been invited for an interview. That's a mistake most people make. They send in a generic CV, okay? A CV that they've used to apply to a thousand and one companies. They don't tailor the CV. They don't research the company. They think, oh, once I get the interview, before I go for the interview, I'll research the company. No, you research, your research starts from when you see the job advert. You research about the company. What are their values? You know, what are their objectives? What are their goals? Their long-term goals? What kind of people do they hire? You know, if you, if you go on a lot of um, social media platforms like Quora, Reddit, and all those places, um, you would see or hear discussions and I think there's one um or rather rich discussions there's one glass door glass door talks about people's experiences employee experiences in different companies you research them know what the company really wants to achieve and then you align your personal statement to fit that okay making sure that you don't say what you are not because Honesty is always the best principle. If you lie, you will get caught anyway. But you want to look at all your skills, all your achievements, who you are, and how it aligns with what the company wants. And then you fit all of that into your personal statement and feel confident that if this is the first paragraph that the hiring manager, whoever it is, looks at, it will pick their interest, all right? So my next area of focus is key achievements. It's tempting to put in a lot of information in your CV, but I recommend pick your three biggest achievements because nobody's going to read them anyway, except if you're, you know, you're, you're applying for a really high level role where they really have time. But if it's just a regular entry level role or a mid range, um, is it mid level career role, pick your key achievements, okay? If you're not sure, ring whoever the contact person is and ask them what they expect to see in your CV. The worst they can tell you is, oh, I'm sorry, we can't provide that kind of information. But knowledge is power, all right? So list your three biggest achievements. And again, make sure that they're relevant to the role. Think about what is important to the company. Think about what they've written in the job specification. Make sure that these three things are what they, they are relevant to what the employer is looking for in order of priority. So what is most important to the employer? Order of priority, make sure that your three biggest achievements that you share demonstrate these things, okay? And questions you can ask are these two that I've put here. What are the three main things the employer is looking for? What attributes are they looking for in this role? And like I said, always tailor your key achievements to the role. And allow me to also say that always tailor your CV to each role. Let's stop this whole generic CV thing. It doesn't work. When hiring managers see a CV, they already know if it's a generic one or not. They've got the skills, they've got the experience, so they can tell. But when your CV is tailored, it tells them something about your personality. You have taken that extra precaution, effort, responsibility, whatever it is you want to call it, you know, but that good attribute and done the needful by making sure that you are addressing what matters to them. Again, it's all about them. So they will be happy. And in those few seconds that they have, your CV will stand out. It's about making a difference. All right. Um, 
Let me see what else I've got in my notes. Okay, so yeah, we're right at the end. Making your CV readable. There's no point having a CV, you know, that you've worked hard on, you've done your research, you've written your statements in a way that demonstrates that you're bringing something quality to the table. And then there's no point having such a CV and then having one that is full of errors, that is not pleasing to the eye. So like I said before, less is more. Always use a simple layout. You cannot, you know, you, 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 you cannot make a mistake using a simple layout. Don't overcrowd your CV. I didn't share pictures of a simple layout because like I said, whatever is readily available on Google is there for us to pick up on. There's no point sharing information that you can pick up at the click of um, your computer, um, at the click of a button or at the, the, the touch of your phone screen, if you know what I mean. So don't overcrowd your CV, okay? If you're looking for example layouts, I'm sure most of us have know these things, but if you're looking for example layouts, please just go to Google, type in, so if you're in the healthcare industry, type in CV layout for healthcare industry. You will see a lot of examples that you can model yours after. If you're in the engineering sector, the same thing. Whatever your industry is, just um, go to Google or any search engine that you use and type in the, the type of layout you want or the kind of layout you're seeking for your industry. Now, don't overcrowd your, your CV. Because we've heard that, oh, it's good for your CV to be short and straight to the point, keep it to two pages, you know, because nobody's going to be reading it. There's this temptation to want to cram in as much information as possible. Don't get caught up in this, okay? Don't get caught up in this because if information is too crowded or if your CV is too crowded, it becomes difficult to pick out the key things and then you've kind of shortchanged yourself and defeated the whole purpose anyway. You want to use a lot of white space, all right? So between your bullet points, you can format it in a way that, you know, you leave just enough white space that makes each line stand out between the different experiences you have, leave white space, make it look nice, simple, okay, and catchy. Use colors sparingly. Less is more, except you're in the creative industry. There's no point using a colorful CV. Black and white, and perhaps dark brown, maybe if you, or navy blue or midnight blue, if you wanted to maybe let your name stand out. I know I have that for my CV. I use the color, a very dark color that isn't black for my name. All right? Um, but like I said, if you want in the creative industry, black and white is fine, or stick to dark colors, but don't use more than two colors. Less is more. Okay, keep the number of fonts you used to a minimum. Use fonts that people are used to. Fonts that are traditional, fonts that kind of, <laughs> let me use this word, responsible for, and it's for lack of a better word because I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> um, rubbish any, any other type of, um, types of fonts. But there's some old faithfuls that will not disappoint you. Times New Roman, Arial, Cambria, Vedana, you know, the types you use in uni when you're or in school, when you're submitting your, your essays, use those kind of fonts, keep them to two, okay? Again, go easy on capitalization. I don't know if you know this, but in this digital age, when you write things in capital letters, things that are maybe not your name or a title or a subheading, if you write, use capital letters just anyhow in the body of the text, it implies that you're shouting, okay? And you don't want to draw unnecessary attention. Anything that is on a plain font is, is an emphasizing feature. So if you use bold, for example, the first thing that will come to the mind of the reader is, why is this thing emboldened? They want to know. And so if you have emboldened it for no reason, they're like, this person doesn't know what they're doing, okay? So go easy on capital, um, the use of capital letters, italics, underlines, and the like. Now, we're down to proofreading. You want to hear your CV. Why? Because our eyes miss things when we've been too used to them. So you spent maybe a week or two crafting an impressive CV, okay? A CV that sells you, you're so confident, but you've looked at that CV so many times that you don't miss out on the, the fact that there's a letter missing because your eyes, our, our minds and our eyes are, they're, they're, they're amazing. We can replace these things if we thought about them. So if you wanted to write 
to that T.O., for example, and you missed it, because you plan to write it, your eyes will see it. A it has happened to me countless times. I am an editor, a professional editor and proofreader, so I know these things and I know, you know how I combat them. It happens to the best of us. It's not about being good at what you do or not. It just happens. So one of the ways to avoid it is to read it out. So when you hear it, you would know if something is missing. And then if, you, if, if you're reading out and you've missed out a letter, you're like, oh, I missed out this letter. And then you can correct it. All right. Another thing you can do is um, trace it with your hand. And these things are so, in fact, they're almost like childish tactics, but they work. And for us, if it works, then it does the job and then we are happy. Okay. So please proofread your, right, um, your, your CV. Look out for spelling errors. Look out for punctuation errors, word usage. Don't write R-I-G-H-T when you want to write W-R-I-T. Okay. Homonyms. These things, don't write B-A-R-E when you want to write B-E-A-R. These things are little foxes that spoil the vine. So watch out for your word usage and grammar mistakes. One thing you can do is if you're not great at grammar, spelling and the like, you can use um, spelling and grammar checkers. You know, there are many free versions available online. Don't depend on them though, but with each suggestion that they give you, check it and with the knowledge you have, ask yourself, hmm, is this correct? If you're not sure, get a second opinion. I'm talking about second opinions. When you finish crafting your CV and you're happy that it's ready to go, it's always a good idea to get somebody that you respect their opinion, you know, to have a read for you. Or if you have somebody in that same field, it doesn't matter whether they are at, your, at the same level or it doesn't matter, let me put it this way, it doesn't matter whatever level they are at. What is most important is that it is the second pair of eyes, they're more objective and they can read through for you. You know, once you've done these things, you can be somewhat confident that your CV will catch the right attention. Okay, do we have any questions? I'm open to taking questions now. That, that is all I have for us. Well, thank you so much, Ma. So parents, if you have questions, please, I uh, will be able to pick just one question because of our time. And um, if you have further questions, do not um hesitate to get in touch with me so i can you know um i can connect you with um, um dr lola so if she's happy okay. okay any questions i can't see anything in the chat if you have any question just wave and we she will call you any question on cv <laughs> okay probably if there's no question okay i'm just gonna wrap up before we yeah that's fine and um, before I go, I've got my contact details. And if you're really keen on learning how to um, improve your CV, or if, you're, if you know that maybe that you're going to be changing careers in the near future, or you're going to be applying for jobs, I've got to work in the pipeline. It's not ready yet. I've got, um, it's not, let me try and share the screen. Yes. So I've got a book. It's written, but it's not um, been published yet. I plan to put it on Amazon and just generally launch it on the 1st of, sorry, on the 9th, it was going to be the 1st before, <laughs> on the 9th of November. So it's for people that are seeking or that seeking, you know, jobs, people that um, have to, are in a phase where they're applying for lots of interviews. So people that just left college or uni, you know, people that are going through a career change and all of that. So um, if you want to know more about it or you want to pre-order an electronic copy, send me an email to find out more okay and if not in the future you can just type my name into amazon and see what it brings out i'm sure you'll be able to find a copy to buy all right and here are my contact details you can find me on social media facebook instagram and linkedin as lola iongai phd and there's my mobile number my business line um, you can copy it if you feel that you will need it in the future and uh, my email is lolaayongbai at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with me um, via writebetterafrica at gmail.com. My website is down at the moment, which is why I have not put it up. Um, it's been redesigned. But for official purposes, it is very simple. It's www.lolaayongbai.com. So thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor you know, speaking to you all on a topic that I love. Um, and I hope that you'll, you'll be able to put all the things I spoke to you about into 
um, useful or into good use. <laughs> that's the word, or that's the phrase. Into it's good a process. Use. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Thank you so much. Let's not for Jesus. Yes, right. So, um, Ma, kindly make me the host back, okay? So, thank I you. We'll do that now. Uh, we've learned so much. I'm actually very blessed. I thought I know, you know, CV, but I've, you know, I've learned more anyway, you know, about CV, you know, writing. So, thank you so much yeah. for that. And we've recorded Sorry, I, I speak, I speak quite fast as well. I hope I wasn't rushing through it. No, no, no. Very clear. But... Very perfect. Perfect, Ma. <laughs> Good. I'm happy to hear that. Thanks for the feedback. Thank you. So I've recorded the session. All right. Thank you. Parent. So, um, and I will send your okay. information to them. By the way, so that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I would like to introduce our our um, our speaker, uh, Sam, Mr. Sam Ade Piron. So this session is the most important. Uh, it's not well. Every session uh, are very important, but this one is very critical. So our dad will be teaching us on how to improve uh, uh, and develop learning skills in parents. So um, in children, sorry. So parents, please do not rush away. Let's try to listen, you know, to this session. I pray we go there for Jesus' name. So are you there, sir? <laughs> yes, I am. Can you hear me? Good to have you. Good evening, ma'am. Oh. Good to have you. I mean, good to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope I am audible enough. Yes, very clear. Perfect. All right. Thank you. For whatever reason, my network um, started misbehaving towards the end of Dr. Lala's session. I, I had to start praying. <laughs> uh, I, had been, uh, I had been on for almost all the session. Uh, I, I, I came in while the evangelist was still speaking, uh, you know, and somehow... Uh, my network started misbehaving towards the end, and I was like, no, this shall not happen. I'm, I'm glad to be here um, this evening. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the privilege uh, to be a blessing to parents. Um, it's, 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 it's a privilege that I do not take for granted, uh, and I want to salute my Oga. I call, him, I call her my Oga. <laughs> All right, she's my writing coach, actually, and that's um, Dr. Lola. Uh, we just finished speaking to us. Uh, thank you so much um, for the opportunity. You were the one who connected us um, somehow, and um, I, I do not take that for granted. Okay, um, it's been awesome being here, um, and I have had a wonderful time myself. I didn't just want to come as a speaker. I, w I wanted to ensure that I was part of the process, the learning process, uh, because learning is a process and learning is a continuous process. You don't stop learning, um, except you want to start dying, <laughs> literally now, okay? Because um, uh, it's important that we are constantly in tune. We are constantly in touch with the realities around us. And uh, one major way by which we do this uh, is what I want to be talking about this evening very shortly. Um, let me see, I, I have to time myself so that I don't spend so much time. Okay, um, learning is very critical um, for our living. And as parents, um, we have a very great role to play uh, when it comes to helping our children to cultivate this skill uh, because it's, it's, it's something that is very, very important. <laughs> uh, it cannot be overemphasized. And I am meant to be talking about reading and writing, but uh, because of time, uh, I am just going to focus more on reading uh, because as you will see by the time I explain that um, reading plays a major role in any kind of growth and when it comes to personal development. By the way, my name is Sam Adetim. Let me introduce myself uh, again. Um, I'm a personal development expert, um, a book publishing consultant, and a distinctive editor. That's what I do uh, professionally um, to ensure that people write well and their writing um, is, is, is well polished. Uh, for some, I help them to actually produce their writing uh, when it comes to sharing their thoughts and ideas in written form, and then, of course, taking them through the polishing path, and then, of course, also helping them to get their works published excellently. Uh, that's what I do. And uh, one of the things I do as a personal development expert, my own unique selling point um, is the fact that I am a reading coach. Uh, this is what I do with all of my heart. I'm so passionate about it. I, I, I help people to read. <laughs> I, I say that I help people to cultivate healthy reading habits that is requisite for purposeful living. All right. This is something I've been doing for about five years now. 
Uh, I started out in 2013. I have had several training, uh, one-on-one sessions, uh, you know, and it's been amazing. Uh, I have come to discover that many people know that they should be reading, uh, but um, not too many people know how they should be reading. Okay, and uh, I, am, I am glad for every parent that is listening to me now because the work starts with you. Uh, uh, it, it, it begins with you. You know, we have the greatest influence on our children. Um, I am a father of two children. <laughs> I have a boy and a girl. And um, I have learned to see that the best way to help my children to act right is to act right myself. Okay, uh, you know, many times we want to instruct our children uh, to do certain things, but most of the time we lose them. We lose them, uh, 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 like uh, uh, Mr. Aaron was talking uh, the other time. We lose them because we are not really connecting with them. We are not helping them to see why they should be doing what we want them to do. Rather, we just want them to do what we are asking them to do. And it doesn't work like that. Okay, so when it comes to uh, uh, the learning skill, you know, uh, there are four major ones. Um, and that's the, 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 the speaking skill, like I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you right now. Uh, there's the listening skill, and there's the writing skill, and then there's, of course, the reading skill. Now, take a minute to just think back to how your children have developed over the years. Uh, you will see that this is practical uh, because how do they learn to start speaking? For instance, they start learning to speak by listening to you, their parents. You know, your, your children begin to pick one word here, one word there, you know, and before you know it, they, they can articulate, they can put their words together, they can express themselves, and you are just wondering, how did it happen? It's simple. They were observing you. They were learning by experience. Okay, so their listening skill is, is, is probably one of the first skills that is developed uh, as they grow up. Then, of course, they are, they are able to also talk or speak back to you. Then, of course, uh, we send them to school and they begin to learn how to write or how to read and write. But most of the time, the, the things they do in school, uh, first of all, is to be taught how to write. Then as they are being taught how to write, they are also introduced to how to read, okay? Uh, but I have discovered that when it comes to personal development, which is a must for everybody, uh, we must inculcate this um, mentality in our children that they have to keep developing, all right? Um, but like I am saying, which is going to be my emphasis in this teaching, you have to show them that you are also developing, <laughs> I remember my son, he was about two years old when I began to notice that he was drawn towards reading and I could guess what was happening. I could guess what was making that possible because he had seen his dad read, you know, our open books for him, you know, even though I know that he may not be able to understand some of the things I was reading to him, I understood the process of, uh, you know, uh, just getting him aware of the fact that there is something called a book, you know, and there are words in the book. And then, of course, you are meant to be able to read the words. You are meant to be able to interpret, okay? Uh, and, and, and then, of course, that's another way by which you also express yourself. You know, that's the way you communicate with other people and the rest like that. So I kept on reading to him over and over again, and I discovered that he, he started having that strong passion, or that likeness for reading, okay? So the best way to influence your children is to show them the way. Don't tell them the way. Show them the way. You know, I can tell you the way. I can describe the way to you, but I am a better influencer when I show you the way. So I am not just telling you that you should read uh, as a culture. Now, for instance, most of our children feel that they are meant to read because they are meant to pass. <laughs> and we need, to, we need to correct that impression. Some of them feel that they go to school just because they are meant to read to pass. They, 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 for most of them, they feel that they learn to pass. <laughs> but learning is beyond passing. Learning is beyond what you can get. Learning for you is, first of all, um, your, your development, your ability to develop mentally, you know, uh, uh, spiritually, every facet of life. You know, man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body. And so ideally, your reading should help you to grow in those three areas. All right. That's 
the whole essence of personal development. God, even God, uh, you know, uh, the scripture says in 3 John 2, I, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Okay, so that means God is expecting us to be prospering spiritually. He's expecting us to be prospering, uh, uh, um, you know, um, in, in intellectually or in our soul. He's expecting us to be prospering physically. That's our health now. All right. So, uh, but one of the ways by which we get to achieve this is exposure to the right knowledge. Okay. Knowledge have been trapped in books. <laughs> if you want to get the best experience in life, you want to get the best counsel. You want to get the best, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Lola was just talking about the fact that there are things you can check up in Google. Certain people sat down to capture those experiences, to capture those templates, to capture those stories, to capture those uh, how-tos, you know, and they captured it in writing for you so that you can read, understand, and apply. All right. So uh, the best of knowledge, the best of counsel, the best of experience, the best of expertise have been captured in books. All right. And that's why you discover that there is no form of personal development you want to uh, go through. In fact, there's absolutely no kind of training you would go through that will not involve you reading or writing. Uh, like I know that some of you are taking notes already because you want to capture certain thoughts, certain ideas that are being shared now. You don't want to lose them. So you are capturing them in writing. So that already tells you that writing is important. But why are you capturing them in writing? It's because you want to be able to read them again, you know, uh, meditate on them, uh, regurgitate as a way, you know, like you chew it, you, you, you chew it to pieces, extract all the nutrients in it, then you pour it out, you apply it to your life. That's why you write it down, okay? So it's important that we see that reading and writing are very critical. In fact, they are so important for our development. And if we want our children to be better than us, if we want them to be all that God has designed them to be, we need to introduce them to the skills early enough, all right? Um, but the first point I'm making, if you don't get anything from what I'm saying today, please make sure you get this, is the fact that it starts with you. It starts with you as the parent. You cannot possibly encourage your children to read without showing them how to read by reading yourself. Okay, I have also established the fact that we need to let them see that they don't read to pass. All right, I am from Nigeria, West Africa, and um, you know, uh, it, it's a third world nation. We have our struggles, but we also have our blessings. I'm blessed to be a Nigerian, I am so proud of my nation, and uh, I believe great things will keep happening for us. All right, but one of the challenges we have is that. Uh, uh, when it comes to the education system, uh, many people feel, and like most of us when we're going to school, we feel that we are meant to read to pass, all right? We're meant to read because of, of our grades, all right? That's the way our education system has been structured. So there are many things I can tell you, I'll be honest, I'll confess, there are many things that I learned in school that I don't remember anymore, <laughs> all right? I studied plant physiology and crop production. I was an agricultural student. All right, so I have a, 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 a bachelor uh, degree in agriculture, you know. And um, so if you ask me today to tell you some of the things I learned in school, I will not be able to give it back to you. But I remember or I know of a truth that I was actually schooled. I was educated <laughs> and I am still educated, all right, because education is beyond the four walls of school. How have I been able to do that? Beyond what I practiced in school, beyond what I studied in school, I have given time to read. I have read wide. I have, you know, I, I have read after my passion. I have read to help myself in what I do. So I am more knowledgeable. I can interact, you know, I can relate with you like I'm talking presently because I have learned certain things by reading, not because I learned them in school. Okay, so we need to help our children to see that school is beyond just cramming, just getting the knowledge momentarily so that you can pour it back in your papers, get a good grade, run away, and you have, you have graduated, you can show off in your CV that you graduated with a first class. I love what Dr. Lala was saying. Your PhD means nothing if we don't know the benefit, if we don't know what is going to be adding to you as a person or what it has added to you as a person and what is going to be adding to your environment, your establishment where you're going to be working, all right? So we need to help our children see that we don't send them to school just because of 
passing their, their, their exams or getting good grades, graduating with good classes and the rest like that. For so many people, their learning stopped the moment they left school. <laughs> I'm speaking from experience, all right, because I've interacted with a lot of people. Because in the school system, there is, a, there is an operating system that helps you to read, even if you don't want to read because your grades are involved, <laughs> you know, uh, your certificate is involved, your, your certificate is at stake. And then of course, your parents are on your neck because you must not allow their money to, to, to go down the drain. You, you cannot afford to waste their money. So there were a lot of motivation involved to help us pass through school. So for many people, as soon as they finish school, they are just there. They are looking for jobs and probably after why well, because of the, 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 the system, the unavailability of jobs, they just forget about anything, personal development, you know, and they are just there. So we need to help our children see that reading is important. Reading is a pathway to knowledge. In fact, reading is the vehicle of education. <laughs> and I, when we're talking of education, now we're not just talking about your discipline or the course you study in school. No, we are talking about uh, being whole, being, uh, 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 being knowledgeable, having the right kind of information for living, knowing what to do, when to do it, how to do it, with whom to do it, for whom to do it part-time. A whole lot of things is involved in education. So uh, it's not just enough to go to school. You have to be truly educated. And one way by which we achieve that in this season is to read. So if you have not been reading as a parent, I am encouraging you. <laughs> I am admonishing you. I am begging you to make reading a hobby. Make it a habit. Show your children how to read. Don't just tell them to read. All right, because it's important for your growth. It's important for your growth, first of all. And one of the things we don't know, I am a parent, uh, 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 and I know that <laughs> to, to give the best as a parent, I need to keep getting better. I need to keep improving on myself. So there are times when I am real with myself, and I know that, oh, guy, you need to get knowledge in this area. For instance, I am I, learning how to relate more with my son and I discovered that the way I relate with my son has to be different from the way I relate with my daughter because they are two different personalities, two different people, all right, with two different uh, uh, composition, both physiologically and psychologically, <laughs> all right? So I cannot afford to be uh, 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 a dull parent, <laughs> you know? I know what I have had to do. I know what I'm still doing to become a better parent. So you see that reading for you as a parent is first of all for you, is first of all for your personal development. I learn how to talk to my children. I learn how to make them feel that I love them. I learn how to pass information across. I, I must salute you parents, I salute you specially, because one of the hardest things to do is to make your children series with you. <laughs> you know, uh, there are times when I, I have to appreciate the teachers, you know, uh, who are teaching this, these children in school, because at times I'm trying to explain something to my son and he's not getting me, you know, so I have to learn how to come to his level. All of these things comes by exposure to the right knowledge, okay? So let us see that knowledge is important. Knowledge makes us powerful. Yes, they say knowledge is power, and that is true, because it, it gives you the ability, it shows you the ability to get work done, all right? But you don't really become powerful until you have applied the knowledge, okay? It's one of the things I teach uh, when, when I take people through the, my reading courses that it's not enough to read. The end point of reading is that you apply the knowledge that you have gotten. So as I begin to round off, uh, because this is a very, very uh, uh, voluminous topic that I cannot cover in this few minutes, but I want to teach you uh, five tools. Let me say it that way. I want to introduce to you five tools that you can use to help to develop your children's uh, you know, writing and reading skill, especially reading. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I, I, I love to use acronyms so that it's easy for you to remember. I have tagged it VET to how. VET, V E T to how. That means there are two hours I'm going to be talking about. So each of those letters stands for a two, which I'm going to explain in quick succession. Now, number one, V is value. You need to help your children get or put value on reading, on their personal development. <laughs> it's very important. 
all right? Because what you value, you make time for. What you value, you invest in. A value is the worth that you place on something. So I can have worth, but you may not be able to enjoy my worth if you have not come to terms with the value that I carry. So at the end of the day, there are two dimensions of value. There is the value that the object or the item or the phenomenon carries. And then there is the value that you place on it. That means you have come to terms with the value it carries. You appreciate the value it carries. And you recognize that value and put it in high esteem. Okay? So we must put premium. We must put value into reading. You need to help your children to see that this thing is of value, is of worth. Something that's of value is something that adds to you. It doesn't take away from you. It adds to you. So that's one of the things that reading does, and you need to help your children to see that reading helps them to be valuable at the end of the day because the more you learn, the more you will earn. <laughs> All right? The more you learn, the more you put yourself or you position yourself to and, of course, all of us want our children to do well. We want them to, uh, 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 you know, succeed more than us. We want them to have good jobs, you know, to be highly placed in the society. All right. But one way by which they can achieve that, especially in this competitive season, especially in this competitive generation, especially in this time when there is so much people chasing one thing, it's the fact that they need to learn. They need to distinguish themselves. You know, and it puts them in a position to earn more. Look at the people that are earning more these days. You can, you can already say for yourself, or you will agree with me, that there are people who have put more resources, who are doing more when it comes to learning. So the more you learn, the more you position yourself to earn. And that's very, very important. So value is where you start. When you place value on reading as a parent, you will help your children because uh, the reason why I'm focusing on reading is the fact that reading will eventually improve their writing, but we cannot go into that details today. All right. So that's number one. Number two is environment. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me read the definition of environment that I have here. It's the surroundings of and influences on a particular item of interest. The surroundings of and the influences on. Now, one of the ways that, and it has been proven, that one of the things that helps our children to grow or what makes them turn out the way they turn out is the environment, all right? It's not just about the food they eat. It's not just about uh, 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 what we give them. The environment actually affects them positively or negatively. So you can create an environment that encourages reading. How many books do you have in your house? <laughs> All right, that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a question for every parent. Now, just look inside yourself and, and, and rate yourself. Um, how many books do you have in your house? Do you have a library in your house? Do you have a room where when your children enter, they know that this is a place where we read. This is a place where we can get resources to, 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 to get better. All right. Let's invest in that in case you don't have a reading environment. You can create a reading environment. Do you have a chair and a table in your house, okay, where your, your, my, my, my children know that when daddy enters this particular room, it's, he's going to read, he's going to study, okay? They enter there once in a while because I want them to, to begin to enter that environment and I want that environment to enter into them. All right, these things are psychological. It also has a spiritual undertone, you know, because the more they see you do it, the more they see that this is what should be done or this is how it should be done, all right? So I am not just going to be telling them as they grow up uh, that, okay, uh, you have to read, you have to read. No, they are seeing me read. I have created an environment where they can read, okay? So buy books for your children, all right? Stake, stake books on the wall, maybe pictures of books for knowledge. That's very important. E, and we are, now we are talking about T, and that's tradition. You know, when you're talking about tradition, you're talking about culture. It's a way of life, a way of doing things. All right, so uh, uh, has it become a tradition in your home to read consistently, to expose yourself to the right knowledge, the knowledge that you need to live a purposeful life. 
it's very important. So make it a tradition, a family tradition. You know, we have family traditions, okay? Uh, but how many of us are deliberate about having reading as a tradition in our family? That's another question for you to answer, all right? And then the next one is, um, the, the first R, you know, is routine, routine. Tradition is different from routine, but routine can help you develop a tradition, okay? Routine talks about practice, what you do daily. Now, uh, one of the things I teach, which has also been established, is the fact that uh, what makes the difference at the end of the day in our results, in our outcomes in life, is what we do daily. The habits we cultivate, the habits, you know, the things we do on a regular basis, those are the things that makes us at the end of the day. So have you made a routine out of reading? You need to learn how to develop a routine for reading. Okay, maybe every morning before you step out is when you want to read as a parent. When you do it, encourage your children to do the same. Let them have a routine for reading. When they come back from school, okay, do, 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 you, do you have a time for them to read? I'm not even talking about school books now. <laughs> we need to tell, take them beyond school books. Yes, they are learning in school. It's, it's part of education. But we are talking about all some education, all around education. Let them begin to read about other things, about other fields, about other necessary things that will help them stand out in life. Have a routine. You can create a schedule for them to read and to read on particular topics, on particular issues. You know, you can say one hour daily, 30 minutes daily, 20 minutes daily. Just ensure that it's a daily affair. It's a routine. After a while, it becomes autopilot. You don't have to force them to read, all right? And then, of course, the last one is reward. Uh, what you reward will increase. What you reward, you, you encourage people when you reward them. So you need to reward reading. <laughs> okay, if you can finish this, this book this week, I'm going to buy you this. Oh, you've been asking me for this particular toy. I'm going to get it for you on this condition. That you're going to finish this book. You're going to tell me what you read. You're going to show me your notes from the book. <laughs> and then, of course, there's going to be a reward. You can buy just a, a little something. You can take them out. You know, that fulfillment that comes with the fact that I did something and this is my reward for it. It's very, very uh, wonderful. And it does a whole lot of good for your children. So don't forget value, environment, tradition, routine, and reward. This is one formula that I can bet that if you apply yourself to it and apply yourself consistently to it, you will help your children to improve their reading and, of course, by extension, their writing. Everything I have said about reading, you can apply it to writing, okay? Uh, because reading and writing cannot be separated, really. <laughs> they are integrated. You cannot really separate them. One will always lead to the other. Of course, other things like talk about is how to retain more, how to read fast, how to concentrate when you read, you know, and all of the rest like that. But because of time, we will not be able to get into that. But I, I hope that you have gotten one or two things from this short uh, talk of mine, that as a parent, you have to show the way. You lead by example. That's the greatest influence you have. Create the right environment for your children. Let them value reading. Let them see it as something that will add to them, that will make their lives better. As you keep doing all of this, uh, you can be so sure that you would have helped them tremendously and they'll be grateful for life that you did that for them. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I think I'm going to round it up there. Thank you for thank the you, opportunity. <laughs> Let's clap for yes, Jesus. Let's clap for Jesus. Let's clap for Jesus. We are so blessed. <laughs> Honestly, I am Thank so God. blessed Thank today. God. Thank you so much, sir, for your for the Thank time. God. So yes, if you don't man. mind, we Thank might you, want man. to invite you in, in future, you know, just to come. Probably we have like an hour with you instead of rushing you through. So we can invite parents no who will be interested. <laughs> So it might not be all parents, no it's problem, all parents who are keen, you know, to develop their children learning skills so they can connect, you know, no problem. to you. Thank you so no much. No problem, Ma. I'll <laughs> gladly do that. Thank you so much, Ma. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yeah. that's yeah. the end of our program tonight. Um, parents, we are so honored to have you here. We are so blessed. Thank you so much for being intentional. You know, because it, it can only be uh, it can only be intentional parents who will you know stay from beginning to the end. So you are so curious, you know, to learn more about uh, and for your children. So we are so grateful. Thank you so much. So we call one of our our parents to pray for us. Oh, thank you, mommy has approved it over there. That's my 
mother in the Lord, <laughs> Pastor or uh, Mrs. Deborah uh, of Mojeni. So, Mommy, are you available to pray for us? Are you free, man, to just give us an opening prayer? I'm suspecting she might be at work. Yeah. Are you, are you okay, man? To so go ahead. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, let's last thing, Father, King of glory. We bless the holy name, O oh Lord, we thank you for this wonderful program. Father, accept our thanks in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Baba, we pray for our sister. Grant, grant her more grace to function in the name of Jesus. Amen. You will not that. You will not fail in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And I pray for all our parents that God will give us grace to accomplish God's purpose for our children in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. At the end of our life, Father Lord, we pray that we will not be condemned because of our children in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for all our children as well. Father Lord, give God, grant them grace to know you more in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And to fulfill their purpose in the land of the living in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Bless the holy name, O Lord. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen, 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 in Jesus' name. So thank you so much for your time. God bless your parents. So we look forward to have you some other time. Take care. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Oh, God. Thank you.